Yeah. Uh, Can I just go? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm just gonna, I need to uh, say a few words, quick note, let everyone know um, that uh, I'm recording the lecture. Yeah. And, um, and just to uh, do the, the whole song and dance. Uh, my name is Dustin O'Hara. I'm the director of the Internet Studies Center uh, here at Western Washington University. Um, the uh, Internet Studies Center uh, aims to foster uh, an interdisciplinary approach to the study and design of digital technologies. And the lecture series is presenting leading scholars and uh, practitioners whose work challenges and extends our understanding of digital technologies and its place in the world. Um, a bit about our speaker today, Carl. Uh, Di Salvo is an associate professor at uh, Georgia Institute of Technology with appointments in the School of Interactive Computing and the School of Literature, Media and Communication. Uh, his work examines the social and political qualities of contemporary design. Uh, his first book, Adversarial Design, was published by MIT Press. Super interesting book. Definitely suggest you check it out. And he's also the editor of the journal Design Issues. And with that, Let's give a warm welcome. Hello, thank you for, for joining us today, Carl. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, um, uh, you know, be, just before this got started, Dustin was asking me, is this new or not new? And I have to admit, um, the field work and design work that I'm gonna be presenting tonight is not new, but the approach to it is really new. And so it's gonna be rough around some edges and when I um, got through a practice version of the talk um, earlier, I realized that really what this talk is doing is trying to outline, I think, um, uh, a set of research directions that I'm interested in and I'm gonna share with you this evening. Um, and so uh, without further ado, um, the talk that I wanna give is on sceneful civics. And what I'm going to try to do over the next 40 or 50 minutes or so um, is explain what I mean by this idea of seamfulness and how it's useful to us in design. And in particularly, um, many ways, this talk is, is sort of thinking about a, a civic tech or um, even more particular than that, like an HCI, human computer interaction audience um, where one of the challenges is to think about, you know, what are concepts and frameworks that we can use um, in the design of civic technologies and practices. And so at Georgia Tech, um, I run a studio. Um, we changed our name last year at the request of the graduate students. Um, we're now uh, called the Experimental Civic Studio. And what we do is we explore how design and computing shapes our public lives and inspires our political imagination. And one of the questions that we are really interested in is this question, what is democracy after computing? And inherent in that question um, is the suggestion that somehow democracy has changed with the introduction of computing and along with that uh, data and a variety of other aspects of computing. And I think we very much believe that, um, that whatever it is that we do as doing democracy um, now is different than it was before the advent of computing and before the ways in which computing and data and algorithms and sensors and such really came to permeate um, our both our public and our private environments. And within this, a question that um, has, has long been of interest to us is, is really working with communities and understanding how is it that communities make use of data and computation to achieve their political goals. So the way that we do this is through participatory design. And I want to spend a, a minute or two talking about participatory design, because for us, participatory design is um, is a method. It's also a set of values that are important to us. And a lot of times when we talk about participatory design, it gets cast as going out and doing creative things with potential users to inform, um, you know, some new product. And, and we really fall in a tradition of participatory design 
that began in Scandinavia in the 1970s, which was fundamentally concerned with the question about how do you preserve democracy in the workplace? And this was important because at the time, new technologies, actually computing technologies, were coming into the workplace and changing the way that labor happened. And the tenet of participatory design is that those who are most affected by a system should have some say in the design of that system. And so as part of early participatory design, there was this idea about democracy in the workplace. And then also as part of that about preserving labor as skilled activities. So how do we, when we introduce new technologies, how do we keep um, labor as a skilled activity? Contemporary participatory design is different, right? The question about the workplace still continues today, but participatory design has expanded. And rather than thinking about democracy in the workplace, or in addition to thinking about democracy in the workplace, much of contemporary participatory design is also really concerned about democracy in public life. So another way I like to talk about this is if early participatory design was about democracy in the workplace, contemporary participatory design is about the work of democracy in the public sphere. And part of this is understanding citizenship as a practice, right? Something that we engage in as a activity, right? And so the question is, is you know, understanding what, what is that idea of citizenship as a practice? Now, there's a really important difference between early participatory design and contemporary participatory design in terms of the context. And that difference is, is that early participatory design, the settings were already a given and the task was to research how to sustain this. So there was already democracy in the workplace, right? These activities were taking place in a work environment in which unions were strong. Contemporary participatory design is different because all of these ideas are not given, they're contested. Like, what is democracy? Is democracy even the right structure to be having for contemporary um, engagement, right? What is citizenship? Who is a citizen? How is a citizen, right? So the different, there's an important difference between things that are given, right? Where the work is to sustain it and things that are contested or, and still emerging where the work is to figure out how does whatever democracy is or is going to be, whatever citizenship is or is going to be, whatever these practices is or are going to be, how are those to be invented? And how do we deal with differences in opinion around the answers to that question? So I'm gonna give you the crux of the argument at the beginning, um, and then we'll come back to it at the end. One of our arguments is that one of the ways to understand participation and citizenship as a practice and democracy is around the tension between seamlessness and seamfulness. Right? And I wanna set up three things here to, to understand this. The first is that civic processes and technologies often aim for seamlessness. Right? Um, I'm not gonna go into depth on this, I would say, actually, if you want to see a great argument for this, you could look, I saw Gabe is on here, Gabe and Eric's book, Meaningful uh, Inefficiencies, right? This is a great example of an alternative to seamlessness because, or so, yeah, seamlessness, because a lot of times seamlessness and efficiency go hand in hand. But the predominant discourses around civic tech are the idea that they should be seamless. So I'm not going to go through hundreds of examples. I'm just going to give you one that I found today. Um, that was made by our now um, vice president. And it's these kinds of statements, right, that, that ultimately local governments to tap into the power of technology to provide seamful and effective services that motivate a lot of civic tech. Our argument is that at the end of the day, civic data infrastructures and civic data practices are not seamless. They're seamful. And actually those seams are meaningful and important, right? And so then the challenge I would say is for us to research and identify and maintain certain themes that support communities and their political goals, and also to identify and patch other themes that provide novel courses for action. And what I wanna do is show a series of examples of that. So my work is very local. 
And that's an important part of understanding this. Um, my work is grounded in Atlanta, which is a very particular kind of city. And for the last several years, it's been engaged in a series of conversations with folks across the city as Atlanta, like many cities, decides to become a smart city. And so the city of Atlanta government has posed this question, what is a smart ATL? And they offer a set of answers um, to it. And what we're interested in doing is complementing the answers that are commonly given with perhaps different answers. Because one of the things that's interesting is that whenever a city, or let's just talk about Atlanta, when Atlanta looks to figure out what is a smart ATL, noticeably they always look to other cities to find the answers, right? And we get visions of what a smart city is like you see here, right? A vision of a smart city where you have a command and control center that is powered by large corporations like IBM and Cisco that have dispersed cameras and sensors throughout the environment that are bringing high data, high bandwidth uh, information into a central location to provide this sort of God's eye view to inform um, centralized decision making, right? So this is one answer of what a smart city is. There are cities that have this system, right? There are cities that aspire to this. Um, our question really is though, what else might a smart city be? And as part of that, and as part of our commitment to engage scholarship, how are the residents in and, and communities of Atlanta already smart, right? What are the ways in which they are already dealing with data and computation? And what can we learn from those sorts of practices? An important part of contextualizing this is also to recognize Atlanta as a city, right? So when we talk about democracy or civics in Atlanta, we're talking about a really important um, history to the city. And I would argue much more broadly, you know, Atlanta is the home of civil rights in the United States, um, or at least one of the homes of civil rights in the United States. And it continues to be an important part of what this city is. So when we think about what does it mean right, to do democracy after computing. My interest is not really, what does that mean at a global level, right? My interest is, what does that mean here and now, right? At a local level in direct forms of democracy, right? Building on the context and history and traditions of um, civil rights that are part of this city that I'm also a uh, resident of. So, what I want to do today with that bit of background is talk you through ways in which we're exploring these questions about how communities are making use of data and computation to address and achieve their political goals, right? Through a very specific project that I call, that we call the Careful Coding Project. So Careful Coding is a resident-led project um, that involves the collection and data and collection and sharing of code violation data. And by code violation, I mean building code violation data. And we'll go into that in a second. The reason the residents are interested in doing this is to advocate for resources and action. So in a common definition of contentious politics, this is an example of that where there are a limited set of resources and one group wants access to those resources and they're trying to build repertoires of action that gets them access to those resources. And in particularly what they wanna do is they wanna address blight and they wanna identify and cite absentee and delinquent owners. So over the past four or five years now, um, we've worked with uh, residents, one very closely. Uh, we've built a series of tools, processes, data sets, and maps. And the project is ongoing. It's obviously had to change a bit in the past um, 10 months, um, but it is an ongoing project. It's set in this neighborhood. This is the English Avenue or Vine City neighborhood. Um, this is actually the Vine City neighborhood of Atlanta. And I didn't take this picture, but it's one of my favorite pictures of the neighborhood. Um, it's also to me somewhat of a heartbreaking picture. So it gives a set of context. This is a neighborhood that is um, kind of a quintessential Atlanta neighborhood. There's a lot of smaller 
wooden bungalows, one and two story homes. Um, it is a historically black neighborhood. It is the neighborhood actually that the King family lived in and some continue to live in. Um, it's a neighborhood that's been subjected to decades of systemic racism. It is overshadowed by the stadium, which you can see there. Um, it's impossible not to see it at night. It glows um, over the neighborhood. Um, and then it's right next to downtown. And if we were to look a little bit to the left of this, you would see that it's also right next to Georgia Tech. What you also see it in the bottom right hand corner is you see a house that's wrapped in a Tyvek sheet, right, that looks like it's new construction with an orange fence around it and a porta potty. It is a neighborhood that is um, now facing gentrification, right? So it is, again, a kind of neighborhood that we see in many cities. Um, this is one particular version of it that is in Atlanta, a historically black neighborhood that as the city grows, um, um, gentrification and displacement happen. And it's within that context um, that our partner, Les, has engaged in code violations collecting. So this is Les. Um, Les lives in the neighborhood. Les works in the neighborhood. He works at a center that provides youth and job training services to residents in the neighborhood. Um, Les raises his family in the neighborhood. And Les created an organization called Block by Block to try to address issues in his neighborhood. And I love these two pictures because um, whenever you meet Les out in the streets, this is what he's doing, right? He's standing around, he's got this Block by Block t-shirt and he's pointing things out in the neighborhood, right? He's showing you what about his neighborhood is special, what he wants to save, what he wants to fix, what he wants to change. And so you see Les there standing, pointing at something. And then on the other image, you see Les riding on a bike with two youth. We'll see them again in a minute. You know, again, pointing, showing off his neighborhood um, that he's a part of. So what one of the things Les has been focused on is code violations, documenting code violations in his neighborhood. These are examples of code violations. So code violations, you can think of as like a speeding ticket, but they're an infraction against building and environment codes. And there could be things like uh, excessive and visible mold and mildew, um, excessive and visible trash and rubbish, um, junk vehicles, meaning vehicles that are up on blocks, severe overgrowth, um, open and vacant housing, um, exterior walls that have been burned or stripped away, um, signs of obvious water damage, um, collapsed roofs, things like that. And what's important about code violations is that they serve as markers. They can serve as markers for absentee and delinquent landlords. So when someone comes in and buys a property and decides to leave it to literally rot while housing prices go up, those properties are more likely to show evidence of code violations. When someone is an absentee or delinquent landlord and allows the lot to get overgrown and dumping to occur, those are absentee and delinquent landlords. And Les wants to have those landlords and owners, those owners, sorry, cited and held responsible. So there's a process for doing this in the city of Atlanta, right? There's a very detailed process the challenge is getting these things recorded because the way this works right now is that code enforcement officers go out to the neighborhood, they walk the streets, they document these sorts of things. Once it's in the system, the process for dealing with it um, is actually fairly streamlined. The problem is, is how do you get it into the system? And how do you do it in a way that meets the political goals of the community members themselves, which are not always the same as those of the city. So currently one does that by using 311 in Atlanta, which is a non-emergency services. 311 is amazing. Not only does it take code violations, it also brings offers information back, such as warming centers or boil advisories or broken um, uh, street mains and flooding. It allows you to refer um, people who are exhibiting mental distress to non-police intervention. 
You can access 311 through almost every platform. You can tweet, you can Facebook, you can Instagram, you can Snapchat. I don't know if you can TikTok. They have an app that's fairly robust that allows you to um, log issues as well as to receive updates. The problem is, is that it's set up in a way to feed into the categories and processes of the city in a very structured manner. So this is from the website, right? If I wanna report um, graffiti problem, I have to go in, I have this list of like actually oddly structured um, options, right? So I would choose graffiti, I would have to choose, um, I'm sorry, I would choose garbage, recycling, graffiti. Then I would have to choose a subcategory, right? In this case, I'm gonna again, um, I'm going with graffiti removal. Then I would be asked this other question, like removal of graffiti and right of way. Like what's right of way? Right? Like, I don't, I don't like, does everyone know what right of way is? How do we understand that, right? And so this structure on the one hand it works, but it's also works in a way that matches how the city functions, which may not be the same way that residents want to engage this topic. All right, so over the past several years, LEF has been collecting code violations by hand. You see a picture of that here. This is a common site. Les is out about in his neighborhood. Um, he's there with a youth um, that has volunteered as part of a credit recovery program. So the youth are getting high school credits um, for volunteering with an activity that involves data. Um, they're out. The youth is taking a picture, in this case, of a boarded up structure that's been boarded up more than six months. You can't see this, but Les is filling out a piece of paperwork uh, to go along with the picture that's going to be taken. And Les does this several days a week um, with volunteers many months out of the year. Here's another image. This is again, sort of common, like uh, Les is not in this picture, but another youth documenting um, another boarded up house in the neighborhood, recording details about that, including the address, how long it's been boarded up, taking a picture, so on and so forth. Again, same sort of thing. In this picture though, you see the youth is actually using a paper form, which is a different kind of form that we work to develop with Les, documenting what's going on in the environment. Sometimes there's tricky situations, right? Um, so this is a tricky situation where they're trying to document a code violation, which is an empty lot, but there's no building, right? And what's really important is the address, right? So this actually happens when quite a bit, there are empty lots where there's no address, there's no structure left for an address to be. Um, it also happens in decrepit buildings where the address has fallen off the building, right? And so you're sitting there and you're looking at this and you're saying, I don't know, what, what address is this? And particularly when you have a situation like this where you have multiple lots um, back to back, you don't know. And not knowing matters. It matters a lot to report to the city whether or not this code violation is at 352 or 354 or 356 Nelms Avenue, right? And so these are kinds of the challenges that happen in doing this collection out, um, out in the city. Here's another example, sort of the flip. I don't know if, if, if any of you have ever been to Atlanta, but um, we are a very verdant city. So there's actually a house behind what you see there. And if you've ever heard about kudzu, um, part of what you're seeing there, particularly in the lower right-hand image, part of the image, is when kudzu takes over a structure. So this is, a, this is a house, right, that has been untended for so long, it has essentially been reclaimed um, by small trees and vines and things like that. Again, what's the address? I don't know. We can see the, the base of the house, if you look closely, sort of like to the left of Les's pants, but there's no address there, but it's clearly a code violation. So Les goes out and collects this data, and then he comes back to his office and he marks off one block at a time where he's collected the data. He uses post-it notes to mark where he needs to go back. Oftentimes a photograph was snapped incorrectly. He needs to go back and re-photograph it. And this is his process of data collection. 
Over the years, we've worked with less in a variety of ways. We've helped try to design different ways of doing data collection. So we've helped try to integrate maps into the data collection process itself. Um, his initial uh, tool on a tablet did not have any sort of map. It's also difficult because less works without Wi-Fi, right? Or, and without cellular. So um, these are tablets that are not connected when he's collecting data. Um, we explored using paper forms with Les because at one point Les was really interested in how do I get more people to participate? Can we use paper-based forms? So we designed paper-based forms. You see some images of those there where it's telling people, here's what you need to collect. Here's a form that allows you to collect it. You can actually go out, you know, keep track of a house, go back at one, three, six, and nine to 12 month intervals sort of accrue data over time, and you don't need any sort of a device or comfort with a device in order to do this. We've also tried to build tools that, that address some of the specific challenges of this data collection and field. So I mentioned that here you have this situation where there's no address, right? There's no structure. So how do we provide less with a way to document this? And what we designed for him um, was a series of paper maps where we actually printed out parcel maps from the city that had the addresses on them that were on the back side of the tablet in an envelope. So as he and the youth were out collecting this data, they could be standing in front of a place where they didn't know the address. They could actually pull out this paper map and use it to orient themselves in order to figure out what the address is. And then we went out with Les um, actually into the neighborhood and prototyped it, used it, put it into practice. So these are the kinds of things that we've been working together with Les over the past several years, trying to figure out what are ways that we can support his already existing practices of data collection, right? Um, and, and what are the ways in which we might be able to help him to do other things than he's currently doing? So what happened? So we collected data for several years and we ended up producing sheets that looked like this. So we had, truly hundreds of code violations that were collected in his neighborhood. This was the output of this activity. It's not some fancy visualization, right? It's a spreadsheet um, with collected information. And then we took that, we geocoded it, and it allowed us to do some kind of obvious things, most obvious being mapping. So Without going into detail here, I think one of the things that's interesting is what we actually also did is we looked up to see whether or not the code violations Les was collecting were part of the city's collection. Um, and here what you see is we have some 250 code violations listed. Of those 39 uh, were actually in the city's database, which means that approximately 200 of them were not. So we could begin to do some things with this data or Les could begin to do some things with this data that he hadn't done before to make some of those requests. We also collected a, a, a many images, right? So we had a, now, in addition to a record of where are code violations in the neighborhood, we had a record of images of those sites that were also timestamped and geocoded. So we had all this and we sat down and we're like, okay, what do we do now, right? Code violations are continuing to happen. There's clearly a huge discrepancy between what Les has collected and what the city's collected. Um, the city seems to be doing the best it can, um, but these code violations aren't being addressed. They're not going away. Um, what kinds of things could we begin to try to think about to do with this data that would give Les perhaps more capacity right, to, to make strong arguments for resources. So we asked, what do we know? What don't we know, right? Um, how can we act with this data? And how do we want to act, right? And, and as part of that, how do we not want to act? And we did this you know, by sitting down um, week after week with Les, going through the data, looking at it closely, reading it together, figuring out what's there and what we might do with it. One of the things that became really interesting as we looked at this data is we realized that 
we knew where all of the code violations were. We knew the addresses for these sites, but we didn't know the owners. Right? And we knew in many cases that the folks who were living there were not the owners, right? In some cases, Les knew that because he knew the people and he said, oh no, they're renting. And, and in other cases, it just seemed obvious. In other cases, we surmised, but we knew that was one thing that we didn't know, right? We didn't know who the owners were. And we realized that that mattered in terms of thinking about what kind of action we wanted to take. For Les, the question of who owns the properties actually addresses the questions of what sort of action should be taken. Les wants to have action taken against the absentee and delinquent owners. Les does not want to have action taken against one of his neighbors or a resident, right, who is simply in a, in a situation that is unfortunate. Right? If someone has a junk car in their front yard that's up on blocks because it's been dumped there, right? Les wants to have the owner of that house cited. If someone has a junk car up on blocks, or let's not call it a junk car, a car up on blocks that's waiting to be fixed and they just don't have the capacity to fix it at this time, Les doesn't want that person to go down the route of a citation, right? So there's a relationship between who owns these properties and what action should be taken. And here's where we begin to hint at some of these ideas about seamfulness and seamlessness, right? Les wants to keep the information that is in his block by block spreadsheets separate from the code violation database, right? And he wants to do that, right? Or rather he wants the information to flow in the way that he wants it to flow because there's a consequence to it, right? Once the information goes into the code violation database, if I use the 311 app, as soon as I hit submit, right, that initiates a legal process. That legal process may or may not end up in a citation, but it will likely end up in a request for a court date. And Les knows that if that process gets initiated on one of his neighbors, it could have dire effects. Right? And so he wants to be able to retain agency in determining what kinds of actions are taken with whom based upon their belonging in the neighborhood, right? And this is, when we think about this, that, that's sort of like an obvious desire to have in a civic space, right? To want to be able to care in certain ways for those that are part of community and to want to be able to hold accountable those who are doing violence to the community and not to want to have the folks you want to care for end up right in a system that's going to be punitive to them. Now, what became interesting is that as we looked into this, the code violation database and the data in there is completely separate from the property ownership database. Here again, there's a seam and there's a reason for this. Code violation data is city data. Property ownership data is county data. Right? I'm not sure what it's like where you're from in Atlanta. Those two organizations, particularly at the level of data right, systems, do not share. There, this data, there was a seam between it and that seam was going to be maintained. So we set about thinking about, given all of this, what could we do? We ended up doing three things that I'm gonna to describe to you briefly. Each of these, I will be really honest, are cheap responses, right? Meaning they're not, um, these aren't standalone apps, right? These aren't um, sophisticated visualizations. These are ways of treating data itself as a kind of design object and trying to think about tactics that again can be used by Les as he advocates for resources um, for his neighborhood. So the first thing we created was a data set that actually brought together the owners of the property with the property address. And we did that by hand. We did that by hand by going to the county um, tax database and searching record by record. 
um, for uh, ownership files, right? And what we found that's pretty interesting um, is, and but perhaps not surprising, right? Is that the owners are actually like we expected, not at all the residents, um, and often live in very different places. Some in very different, some actually not even in Atlanta. So we were able to sort of bring together this new data set and what we produced, doesn't matter that you can't read this because I'll explain it to you. What we produced that Les was able to take back to the city and, and actually offer as a contribution is, here is a data set, right? In which I have already brought together the code violations with the owners of that data and we merge that data set together in a way that previously didn't exist. And so one outcome of this for less and that he could use in the city was a data set that combined together things that previously had not been combined together. What was interesting is once we did that, we could then actually give less another tool that um, was quite powerful in, in certain discussions about trying to, to draw attention to the ways in which investment was happening in the neighborhood. Once we had the location of the owners, we could actually contrast those with the location of the properties. So we built an image browser. I've actually stripped out most of the information here because I don't think you should see all of that. But what the image browser allows you to do is to select any of the properties that are listed in Lessa's data set of um, properties where there are code violations and then see that property alongside the address of the owner, right? And so there's hundreds of these. And this very quickly begins to point out to anyone that wants to sit down and look at this and talk through this, the ways in which there is a gross inequity that's happening here between those who own the properties, right? And the conditions in which the properties are being maintained. Finally, we built for Les a process and tool for routing the data that he collects. And that process and tool is actually nothing more than a collection of Google spreadsheets and forms integrated with email that allows Les to go through and both individually and categorically choose what data goes to code violations through the 311 app and when, and what data doesn't, right? So if he has, again, a car that's up on blocks or a home that the yard is overgrown. And what he wants to do is to organize a church group to do a cleanup on a Sunday, right? Les can sort through his data, mark it in different ways, route that information, either to say, this is going to the city or no, this isn't going to the city, this is going to the church group, right? So let me try to bring this back to a discussion of seamlessness and seamfulness in about 10 minutes um, and why we think this is interesting. And to do that, I'm now gonna give you a bit of background on these terms, um, which you may not be familiar with. The way I'm tracing these terms is through discussions in human-centered computing um, and particularly starting off in ubiquitous computing. And the reason why is because that's one of the environments that I work in and I'm interested in trying to shape um, activity within that environment. So this is a useful set of terminology because it already has meaning right, in this field. Early discussions of ubiquitous computing, tracing it back to Weiser's The Computer for the 21st Century, were really built around an idea of seamlessness, built around this idea that we're going to have a multiplicity of devices. They're going to communicate with each other in a um, sustained and uninterrupted way. And we're going to have a smooth experience as we move through the world, right? And our data hops from one device to another and we hop from one device to another and one room to another. And this early vision of ubiquitous computing was one in which it was all about seamlessness in a way that current discussions of civic tech eerily seem to echo, right? this idea that we can make this environment that's seamless and that that is an inherent design good. Some years later, Chalmers, um, a Ubicomp researcher, makes a counter argument that's fascinating. He says, actually, these environments are not seamless, right? 20 years later, they're really seamful. 
And what's more is understanding those scenes, right? For example, understanding the limits of a GPS technology or RFID technology allows us two things. It allows us to understand the system itself, right? By seeing scenes, it allows us to understand the system itself. And this is actually an old argument, like we could trace this philosophically back to ideas, let's say from he to Heidegger, um, but seeing the seams allow us to understand the system itself and the seams provide affordances for different kinds of creative interactions. Jennifer Tezzi takes this idea from Ubicomp and brings it into the study actually of the practice of science where she talks about, hey, it's not just our devices, right? but our entire technological environments are now seamful. And she does this through a study of um, space science missions and the ways in which seamfulness actually pervades um, planetary space science, Mars rover missions, um, and how that seamfulness is marshaled by the scientists in order to do their work. More recently then, Inman and Ribis make this brilliant argument um, that ties together all of these perspectives. And they have this quote, right, which I'm not going to read in depth. I'm not going to read. But basically, what the quote is says is their argument is, hey, seamfulness and seamlessness are actually, they're not, um, they're not rival approaches, right? They're, they, they, what they say is they complement each other. They're two different ways of thinking about user or downstream agency. And what they're really about is a, is a larger and longer conversation about when is it strategically advantageous to conceal or reveal human operations, right? And we take this from that perspective and are trying to bring it into civics to ask a similar question, like when is it strategically advantageous to reveal and conceal, to move between or keep separate civic infrastructures and practices. So in a way, when, when we're creating the system, right, for less to, to control the data, what we're trying to do is to maintain a seamfulness between his data and the data systems of the city on code violations, right? There is a mismatch, a misalignment between that data. And in fact, what Les wants to do is to retain that misalignment, right, to, to control that communication and then our task as design researchers is to figure out to help to identify and then to design to support that strategic concealing, right? How does he not make known these other code violations? On the flip side, we can think of this other activity as a kind of patching of seams, right? So we're not creating a connection, let's say, between the code violation database and the property ownership database. But what we're doing is we're creating a patch that sits outside of it and draws from both in a way that identifies and then designs to support a strategic revealing or connection. Like what advantages might we have? How might this be a new repertoire of action that we can add to the capacities of communities when we bring this data together in ways that it previously was kept separate? So this gets back to where I started and I'm about to finish that this idea that really the research challenge in front of us is to identify and maintain seams that support communities, to identify and patch seams that support communities towards their political ends. And what's important in this process is to realize that these infrastructures and the practices are seamful. And those seams, again, are often meaningful. For less, they're meaningful because they're about him and his neighbors retaining a sense of agency over whom is brought into what kind of accountability. Right? That's a meaningful seam to sustain. I'd argue that even the seams between the city database and the county database are probably meaningful, right? There are reasons why that data may be kept separate. So it's not to try to achieve seamfulness uh, or seamlessness that should be our goal as folks working in civic design, but to try to understand where these seams exist and why, what's the reasoning behind them and how they're useful. 
So to get back to this question, what is democracy after computing and how do communities make use of data and compu computation to achieve their political goals? One thing that we're trying to argue is that maintaining and patching themes are tactics that enable communities to do this through data. Right? And the challenge before us is to try to identify, are there patterns to this that we can see beyond these one-off instances that I sort of documented tonight? which I admit are very much one-off instances. I think the task before us is to step back and say, yes, but are there broader patterns that we might begin to use to shape design? I wanna end by pointing out, because someone may bring this up, that this is in itself a political and perhaps an ethical question. The question is, what seems do we maintain? What seems do we patch when, how, when and how, right? So it would be fair to say, you are going down a dangerous route by trying to keep certain data um, obscured, right? There are some who would argue that, right? And I actually would not argue against that. I would say that it is a dangerous route, but for those of us who are working in this space, it is the route that we have to explore. These are political questions. Um, choosing when to bridge data, choosing when to keep data separate, right? Choosing what to conceal and what to reveal are ultimately political questions. And what we have to ask are questions about who in fact do the seams serve, right? And what does maintaining or patching the seams enable? And at least from my perspective, the way to answer that question is to go back to the premise of trying to sustain democratic conditions and asking whether or not, right? these seem serve right, um, and enable democratic conditions. So with that, um, I will end my talk um, and hopefully, yes, there's about 10 minutes if there's any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it looks like Gabe has a question. So Gabe, why don't, why don't you just jump in? Hi, Carl, thank you so much uh, for the talk. Really love the work. Um, you know, in, in addition to your point about the role of seamfulness in supporting the preservation of agency about when to engage and when not to engage uh, between communities and city government, I'm also struck by the potential for preserving possibilities around emergent epistemologies in terms of how people um, define what to measure and why to measure it, and then eventually make the case for the value of that. One of the, the challenges, you know, if we look across citizen, the you know, history of citizen science and activism and the role of data collection at local levels, and then eventually bringing those to kind of um, decision-making bodies is the, the translation work, or I guess as you, as you might describe it here, the, the patching moment, right? And I'm curious in this case that you presented, um, if that kind of translation moment or the patching moment, like I, I'd be curious to know what that looked like when the kind of merging of databases uh, took place or, or when brought to the city and how those kind of maybe new um, data points or, or perspectives on what to pay attention to were considered and how that was received by the city. Yeah, thanks for that. Can you hear me okay? The sound just went out for a second. If someone, if everyone can hear me, someone nod their head. Dustin, can you nod yeah, your head? Yeah, I can, okay, I can. great. Okay, great. Um, I agree. Uh, I think there's sort of two questions, or I at least would break that into two questions. So I did not include, there's a whole set of work that I did not include, which is exactly um, what are these encounters or like, how does the data actually um, meet the city? There's two ways that that's occurred in this project so far. One is through, um, and, and they're both in-person settings, right? So at no point in time has there actually been a, like a database connection. Um, it has tended to be, um, well, things have been emailed to the city. We have sat down um, and this gets into another discussion about the role of the university. We have brokered meetings between Les and um, uh, the Office of um, uh, Code Enforcement. Uh, 
um, where we've actually shared that data. And we've brought that data on spreadsheets and on thumb drives, right? And um, as CSVs and Excel files um, pre-formatted so that they can do with it what they want. The other way that, um, that has actually even been more effective is that we collect the data and then when we get a bulk of it, like a hundred or so, um, that seems to be the tipping point. And then the city has sent out a code enforcement officer. And then a lot of times what will happen is like that code enforcement officer will then walk the city, walk the streets with less and, and less will point things out and the code enforcement officer will make a determination at that point in time, whether or not it meets city criteria and actually enter it into the system. Um, so that there, there's a whole, whole set of activities um, around that translation or, and, and that sort of patching that are very, very much about human engagement. Um, I think that the other thing you brought up about these different epistemologies, yeah, without a doubt, like it's really, you know, particularly when you see a neighborhood that's undergoing gentrification, um, it's, it's actually, I'll be honest, like it's heart-wrenching um, for to see um, folks realize that, that certain things have gone away and are not coming back, right? Certain changes have happened. Um, so I think that what this does bring up, you know, particularly when we get to talk to less about the data and when less talks about the data is it's a very different perspective um, on what it means to care for the community and to tend for the community and what aspects of the, of the built environment are important to preserve. Does that try to get at what you were asking? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's great to hear that the, the patching process um, does really come down to this moment of people walking together and having yeah. the conversation yeah. about determining the value of it. Um, and then, and then, yes, that I think to your point um, about the defining what, like, what care is, like, what we care about, I think, is is also a really, a uh, really powerful uh, part of, I think, what what you're describing here. Yeah, and I think, I mean, um, I could I could give the whole care talk. That's, um, and I knew I would actually love to chat with you more about that at some point. I mean, I think the other thing I'll bring up that's really interesting is so it turns out the photos can't be used by the city, uh, or they can only be used in certain ways. And so we presented the city with all these photos, and we're like, we thought this would be valuable. And the city, um, the code enforcement officer said, you know, they're valuable because they let me know where to go and look. But in fact, we can't enter them in. The, the photos have to be taken with a city phone in order to maintain a chain of evidence, right? So it was like this immediate sort of interesting, like we realized like, oh, this is what this legal process is. So it's still worthwhile to take photos, but our photos don't count because they weren't taken with a device that keeps it you know, secure and is not necessarily um, you know, like part of, yeah, what they, they described as the chain of evidence. So it's really interesting also about how, and that to me is very related to discussions of citizen science and, and the veracity of data and, and the tools that are used too. So, uh, have have there been some no, notable repairs that have come out of this process? Yeah, I think there's been both repairs done by the city. Um, there have been, um, I mean, what's interesting is that the repairs that have been, been done by the city have been less to structures like houses and more to structures like retaining walls. Um, and that may have to do with the fact that it's, uh, it's very difficult and very expensive for the city to actually tear down a house or to go in and, and, and um, reclaim ownership of a house. But there have been some examples of that. And there have been some examples of things like lots that Les has been able to go um, to a local church and say like, look, I need, I need you all to volunteer to come and pick up this lot. Otherwise this person's gonna get cited. So there's been examples of being able to to organize action both by the city and by the residents. Very interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, there's definitely a strong connection with, between this idea of, of uh, um, seamlessness, seamfulness, and uh, Gabe's 
book uh, about meaningful inefficiencies. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. there. Um, I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, um, I also kept thinking about while you were talking about the kind of the distinction between the two, between seamfulness and seamlessness. To what extent they're um, they're just kind of differences in perspective around what is ultimately like the same, potentially the same activity. You know, like I don't know, the, or to what degree is seamlessness? You know, in the context of say like smart cities, the sort of discourse around that, just like a fantasy. You know, that somehow we can like everything can be. You know, we can automate everything. You know, automate our problems away. I think it may be a fantasy, but I think it's a fantasy that there's a lot of time and money going towards. And, and, and that's concerning. And I think it's a fantasy. I mean, to me, I guess with like, like, you know, another thing that's really important to me is the idea of democratic pluralism. And I think that a lot of the discussions about making things seamless are really discussions about, um, assimilation and about the sort of erasure of important difference, right? And, and so I think again, as researchers, like one of the things that's important, and, and I agree, like Eric and, and Gabe get at this is, you know, whether we call it seamlessness or, or, or seamfulness or inefficiencies, these things are, are they often, they, you know, they're, they're valuable, they, they speak to, um, desires, they speak to beliefs, they speak in some cases to technical infrastructure that um, there's a reason, right? I mean, again, there's a reason why city data and county data is different. There's a reason why the county is involved with tax assessing in a way that's different than the city. Um, and so it's, it's recognizing that those differences should be understood. And before we rush to try to um, smooth them over to recognize the work that those differences are actually doing and the ways in which many of them perhaps should be maintained. Carl, I have a, a question about, um, <clears throat> as Gabe again, uh, appetite from government to actually engage in, in some of these processes and thinking about how some of what you're learning and, and doing can scale, and I, and I recognize that that question is is obviously in tension with the spirit of, of the work, but certainly, you know, the, the value here is in thinking about new modes of civic engagement that we can um, hopefully see in other parts of the world and, and maybe become regular practice. And, you know, and certainly in, in my work um, at IDEO, you know, we're starting to see uh, governments express appetite for, uh, reimagining engagement, um, and there's there is so much work in in, help, in working with governments to really define what they mean by engagement and participation. And so, um, when when you start talking about these practices, of course, there is this tension with the ability to actually carry this out on a regular basis. And so, I'm I'm curious like in in the work that you've done like how have governments responded to like how have city officials responded to it and have there been conversations about like what the future holds and maybe making this a more regular practice yeah i have a couple of answers um atlanta is not a we're not a boston or chicago or pittsburgh or a los angeles in terms of our approach to data and so it's tough, right? This is not first and foremost the way that the city um, works. And, and so that makes some of these engagements challenging without a doubt. I think that the thing that we have going for us, um, frankly, is that we've been doing this, some of this work, not this particular project, but work like this for a decade. And when you spend a decade showing up um, at City Hall, they may think you're annoying, but they at least recognize you're committed. So, um, I, I mean, I, I think it, in some ways it really comes down to, to the, um, again, the sort of human and local practice. I love the question you ask about IDEO and, and I'm gonna be really honest and, and say, I don't know the answer. I would love to try to think through the answer. I do think there's another way that I often characterize um, our work. And 
I mean absolutely um, no offense by this. I often characterize our work as we do what would not make sense for IDEO to do. And the reason why... Um, no offense taken. So, like, I'm good friends with, or I used to be good friends with Sandy Spiker. Like, I, I, it's not that I, it's, it's that I think that the value of academic work, I think that the thing that academics can provide is that we have a cover from market relevancy that you don't have. And if I try to replicate what a studio or a consultancy can do, right? Um, I should just go work at that studio or consultancy, right? Like I have friends there, like, you know, like if that's what I want to do and I tell them like, that's what I should do because I have deep respect for it. As an academic, I don't have to do things that are fiscally viable, right? I don't have, um, you know, I'm supported by grants and gifts. And I think that what makes, um, I think that it's actually the responsibility of academic designers and researchers to do work that would be difficult to do in industry. And that actually, what we need to do is figure out how to communicate that better um, uh, and to share that out in ways that are useful to you. And are also frankly are useful to government. I mean, I tell this to the folks in city hall, like they're like, we can't implement this program. I'm like, I'm not asking you to implement this program. I'm asking you to collaborate with me to see if this program or something like this would be valuable. Um, and again, I, I would go even a step further. Like, I think that that's my responsibility as a faculty member at a public institution. Like part of my paycheck comes from tax dollars that are paid by residents of Georgia. And so maybe that's idealistic, but that's kind of, that's kind of where I fall. I would love to figure out how to have better channels. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> we, we should talk about those channels. Sure. Yeah, so very, very interesting talk, um, Carl. Uh, really fascinating. Um, yeah, the, I mean, and, and I think the, you know, this I, idea of sort of maintaining the um, boundaries, you know, the, I guess that's what it comes down to, right? Is like, you're, you're talking about so how, how do you, you know, tactics around sort of boundaries of control and agency, you know, and, and you know, in terms of, um, you know, sort of, uh, sort of civic engagement of communities that are interfacing with, you know, local governments. I mean, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's really hard because government also, at least at the municipal level, they're putting out, um, they're putting out fires, right? Sometimes literally. <laughs> Um, and, and so it's often difficult um, to get them to think about, you know, how might you do things uh, differently? And, and, and again, my, my hope is that that's what we can provide as academics is this space where um, we, can, we can experiment in ways that are difficult to, to experiment um, in other contexts. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I like, I, I think your mission of, you know, in terms of your description of, sort of academic research, design or research, and certainly within a public institution is commendable and, um, and it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, I think it's also, I mean, I could talk about this all night. I, I also think, I mean, for me, it's a teaching aspect. So mm -hmm. I work a lot with students and my students are going off to work at studios and industry. And, and this becomes like an opportunity for them for a semester or two semesters or sometimes two years if they're master's students to see like, oh, here's a different way that we can think about design in the world. And I think that's an, a valuable thing to do. Well, um... Thanks again for the talk and sure. uh, take care. Yeah. Toodaloo. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye.